in terms of contributions in the area of structural equation modeling, latent variable modeling, uh, that he is one of the pioneers uh, uh, in this country and uh, one of the most outstanding uh, scholars and teachers uh, that we have on the campus today. So please welcome Professor Greg Hancock. Thank you very much. Um, Today has not really gone according to plan. It's a gorgeous day. You sort of you imagine this day and how things are going to go. And it has been nothing like I thought it was going to, uh, to go. I, I don't know if you're aware, but this particular award comes with a, a stipend to create a social. And some of you walked past the setup out there for the social. And I, I'm not that social a guy, to be honest, right? I'm a stat guy. And I, how many crab stuffed mushroom caps can I eat? So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to take some of that money and, and just be a little indulgent on my special day. Now, I, I only live about 25, 30 miles from here. And so I figured, what's the harm this morning if maybe, just maybe, I, <laughs> you know? Um, so if you're going to do this, you got to do it right. So there, there I am. And it's just, you know, 150. And, and so we cut back on the budget for the snacks outside a little bit, and that's, that's okay. Um, and and it, was, it was glorious. Like on 95 coming down here, there was about 60 seconds where it was simply amazing. Uh, and unfortunately, not, not really what I had planned. So, uh, you know, and I, so I panicked just a tiny bit, and I'm thinking, all right, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a big city guy. I totally know how this works. I've watched Law and Order. Uh, so, you know, I'm in a panic, and I'm thinking, okay, you know. <laughs> I, I, I got this covered. And uh, that, that, you know, it's just a few, <laughs> few dollars there. And that, that didn't go so well this morning. So I had to, uh, well, <clears throat> it <laughs> went on from there. And I, I, I said, you know, like, I, I'm a distinguished scholar teacher. I have to get to campus. Um, you took my $40. And then he got a little bit more aggressive. And so it just sort of one thing led to the other. And it was, oh, it was, very, it was very sad. So I spent a lot of my day, a lot of my day was spent taking care of other things, not really prepping for this. And I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that, and so I also incurred a few extra expenses, and I, I'm assuming the provost's office covers all this. I don't know, uh, I don't know if that's true. So I, I didn't have so much money to get here, and I, I had to start to be a little bit innovative, and I'm thinking, you know, well, I can, I can, I can do this, and uh, and nobody, nobody cared, and so. I, I tried maybe, you know, some of the skills that I actually have. <laughs> and so I got, I got one person who, who came by briefly, uh, but then President Lowe continued on. And uh, so then I just had to resort to sort of the old standard. And within like 10 seconds, 10 seconds, uh, someone did stop. Some young people stopped. Uh, and I, I was kind of encouraged, but then but then they looked kind of upset, and uh, I wasn't exactly sure why they were so upset, and then, then I knew why I recognized <laughs> them. Uh, but I still had to get here. Um, so I, you know, I pleaded a little bit, and they were kind enough to, that, that's kind of scary, they were kind enough to help me out <laughs> and <clears throat> bring me to campus, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, from the students who brought me here today. So thank you. I appreciate that help in getting here, but I'm Thank you <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Oh, and I have I have to say this that no students were harmed <laughs> in the making of this introduction so this talk uh, which is not that this talk is nothing today like what I had anticipated it would be like. I do statistics research. Um, 
research on statistical methods, not going around and taking statistical techniques and applying them to things, although I do that to some extent, but my research is on the methods themselves. And so I had crafted sort of a, a whole presentation in my head, and we had a meeting with the other distinguished scholar teachers uh, and the provost, and the message was very, very clear. We were told, make the talk understandable to English majors, <laughs> all right? That doesn't, that's, not a, that's not a slam against English majors, but it completely recalibrates what it is you're going to do. It means all the statistical methods I was going to talk about, uh, I, I didn't really know how to do it at that level. So I had to change my talk a bit. And I was, even, I was even frustrated with coming up with a title, something that appeals to English majors. What am I going to do? So I thought maybe I could just tweak that a little bit, comedy of error terms, or for Merry Wives of Windsoring, is a, or even just you know, taming a mosquito. <laughs> yeah. But then some people who aren't English majors who don't like Shakespeare, maybe that would alienate them. So I needed something that had numbers involved, but that was personal to me a little bit. And uh, so, you know, maybe. Um, I don't know. Is that too much? Did I go too far with the last one? Um, so I just came back to this, which obviously is something that people can relate to. Uh, you could tell just from the introduction today that people can relate to it, um, because this kind of sentiment is really pervasive in our society, right? We, we, we have this particular feeling, and there are things about our world, right, that, that make us aware of this. Quotes, and this is not a new quote for people, three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Um, if for the English majors, thou shalt not sit with statisticians, nor commit a social science. Uh, and then just more broadly, statistician, someone who's good with numbers, but lacks the personality to be an accountant. Um, uh, so I have, um, it is completely true, I have been to parties and, that's not true, I never get invited to parties, but if I were invited to a party in theory, uh, now, people have actually said the following things to me. This is, this is completely true. Um, why would you choose to do statistics for a living? Just write out. You just meet somebody, and that's the first thing out of their mouth. Or, God, I hated statistics. It was awful. Uh, or statistics? More like sadistics. Um, and you, all of these things have been said. And it just, my profession seems to help people cast aside social graces and niceties and just, just get all of this hostility out. And I was thinking, what if I, what if I were in a different profession? You know, what if I were, for example, um, what if I were an artist and I'm at a party and someone says, so what do you do? And I go, oh, my name's Greg and I'm an artist. You know, can you imagine people saying these kinds of things to an artist that, uh, why would you choose to do art for a living? Or, God, I hate art, it's awful. Or, art, more like fart. Um, <laughs> So I, children, we don't talk like that. You understand this, right? Okay. So it's really, it's really not fair. And if you dig into some of the social media, uh, you go and you find the I Love Statistics group <laughs> with a whopping 25 people. Um, if you go to I Hate Statistics, so as it says here, this club is for all students who hate statistics. Join and express your abhorrence towards statistics. So that's very, very sad. Uh, for, for the English majors, here you go. Love, friendship, and respect. Do not unite people as much as a common hatred for something. I apparently am that something. <laughs> um, so I was trying to figure out, you know, what is it about statistics that really is so uh, that inspires this in people? And so I read a lot of things online. I did some some grounded theory work, some content analysis, some try. I did some qualitative research. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, and I think you can really sum up the reason people hate statistics uh, quite, quite simply. Um, it's that, uh, that every single person you talk to, if you ask them what's going on, they will always make reference back to a class that they had. Uh, that it was just so absolutely awful that they could never possibly see themselves doing this thing. And so I was thinking about what, so what are the things about statistics class that really makes it such a bad experience for people? And I came up with the top five reasons that statistics class sucks. And really the first reason 
is about your expectations, right? Because the people before you said it would suck. And that was the case in my own graduate program. My first graduate program was not in measurement and statistics. It was in educational media. And like everybody had advised me, I waited to take my statistics course last. That, that is the culture that people have. When I became a faculty member, uh, I remember the very first class I was going to teach. I was walking down the hall and uh, to the particular room at Auburn University, and I sort of wound up blending with this gaggle of graduate students making their way to the class. And they're all griping about it. Oh, I, I, this is gonna be, I remember one student said, uh, her name was Louise Green, for the record, it was Louise Green, that her name, she said, uh, she said, I just can't wait to get through this god-awful statistics. And you know, she looks around at all of us walking with her, and I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, and then we, so we walk into the classroom and the students all peel off to the left and take seats. I go up to the right and the color just drained out of all of the students. Ah, that was a good time. Um, <laughs> so, and then when you, when you have students introduce themselves in your intro class, you get things like, uh, I am a qualitative researcher, and that's fine. And then you say, so how much training have you had in qualitative methods? Well, I haven't had any yet but I just know that I'm a qualitative researcher, right? So without even being exposed to things, people are, are, are very much anti-statistics, which means that for my job, I have like 2.9 strikes against me when I walk into that classroom. And that's, that's a lot different from other classroom experiences, right, we, that, we have that, uh, that we have that against us. So another reason that people don't really care for statistics is that it's related to math, and math People, people, you know, have certain reactions to math. It is viewed as a very, very cold topic, and statistics is associated with that in some way. Um, on the other hand, math is something that proves things, right? Math establishes things. Math says things like, I know X because I proved it. Statistics, on the other hand, says things like, well, I, I believe X, or I am reasonably confident in X, but I'm not 100% certain. And that uncertainty seems to drive people crazy, that you can have two reasonable people analyzing the same data set and coming up with different conclusions. Uh, that's a very frustrating thing to people, and they view what we do sort of like this crystal ball gazing, trying to come up with, you know, there's meaning in here somewhere. Uh, that is on Route 1 if you need to go to <laughs> Madame Flora by the way. But the, the phrase that you hear very often starts off like this. You can make the numbers say, what's the rest of that? Anything. Yeah, anything, whatever you want them to say, right? And you, I hear that all the time in my, particular, uh, in my particular world. And so I think part of this is why people are very uncomfortable with statistics. Another problem is that it really doesn't align well uh, with the practice of science as we tend to think about it. And if you drew out a little flow chart for science, which is a very difficult thing to do because there are many different views on what constitutes science and, and so forth, but here's one set of views that would be relatively familiar, that you, you wind up with research questions that lead to hypotheses, predictions, tests, and those wind up informing what you've done. So generally sort of a flow chart. On the other hand, the way that we tend to approach things historically, and some of you will recognize these kinds of words, we, know we set a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis. We, we carry out some significance test, get a test statistic, a p-value, make a decision. And so how exactly is that, is that like science? Where does that fit into the framework? It's a very different way of thinking about things compared to sort of the way we are raised. And this whole process of what's called null hypothesis significance testing just feels very different from what we're accustomed to uh, in science. And so to give you an example, uh, we have Bella there. Edward, do you love me? Uh, well, Bella, let's, I, I can't do my Edward uh, exactly, but uh, <clears throat> I sparkle though in the sunlight. I don't know if you've seen me. Um, <laughs> let's start with a null hypothesis that I do not love you. Uh, under that condition, my current behavior would be highly improbable, p less than 0.05. As a result, it seems reasonable to reject the null hypothesis and instead tentatively retain an alternative hypothesis that contains some non-zero amount of love, <laughs> right? So if statisticians had written Twilight, this is what it would look like. Um, and, you know, Bella's sort of reaction would be something like this, or maybe even you know, maybe even something like that, and, uh, oh yeah. Mm-hmm, 
Mm -hmm. So even, even Bella knows. Uh, so some of the criticisms about the way we approach things in our null hypothesis significance testing uh, are the following, and some of you who have been subjected to these would have, would have heard some of the criticisms, that it works from a rather backward, non-intuitive logic, setting up the thing you don't believe uh, and then trying to go against that. Um, it starts from a null hypothesis uh, that's really usually false. It's hard to imagine a null hypothesis technically being true, that there is no effect, that there is no relationship. Um, as a result, it's often widely misunderstood and interpreted, uh, misinterpreted when we do uh, uh, null hypothesis significance testing. In part, because it doesn't really give us what we're looking for. We want to know something about the likelihood of our hypothesis, and that's not what it gives us. It does something that's, that's very odd. It also sets up this true-false dichotomy that stresses decision above inference, right? If I get a P of 0.051, I might be very sad, and if I get a P of 0.049, I might be very, very happy, and you know what? There's just not a whole lot of difference between 051 and 049 as far as data are concerned, but as far as your future is concerned, right? Uh, that, that feels like a very, like a very big difference. Um, it also tends to generate confusion between what is statistically significant and substantively or practically significant. We often confuse those. Uh, it's not a framework that very easily takes into account prior knowledge or beliefs. Is there any role that my understanding as a content person should have in this particular process? Uh, and then more broadly, it is believed to foster publication bias. Uh, sometimes when you get a retained in all hypothesis, it's very hard to get journals to listen to that. Oh, so you found nothing. I see, yeah, we, we want to publish that. Um, and then it also can make research literature rather difficult to interpret. And as people will say very generally, it, it impedes the progress of science, uh, this particular way of thinking. I, it's probably responsible for healthcare.gov in some way as well, or global warming, or other things as well. Um, I thought it was summarized very, very nicely by Rao. The, in current practice of testing, we are asking the wrong question and getting a confusing answer. And Rao was a student of Fisher, Fisher who is responsible for a lot of the statistical methods that we do. He is, I believe, the last living student of R.A. Fisher. I think he's 126. Uh, no, he's, uh, he's not 126. Uh, but he's got to be 90-something. Um, another reason that there's a problem with statistics class is that the curriculum is very Ptolemaic. And what I mean by that, if you, if you go back to your, uh, your cosmology, um, Ptolemy inherited some ideas from Aristotle, some immutable ideas that the earth is in the center of the universe, goes without saying, and that the planets travel around that in these circular orbits. And, you know, the data really didn't fit that very well, and for a while, you know, we wouldn't even talk about that. But what Ptolemy did to try to address that problem is he made some changes, but not changes like moving Earth out of the middle of the, out of the uh, middle of the universe. Instead, he put these epicycles on, right? So Mars doesn't really just go around the Earth. It goes around the Earth, but every once in a while, it goes, woo, and then it goes on, and then it goes, woo again and it keeps doing it. And that explains why it goes backwards from our vantage point here on Earth. And, and he also did a little bit to, to change the shapes of the orbits a tiny bit. But the problem is that there was something fundamentally flawed at the center of all of that. In the statistics that we teach, the statistics that we train people to do, we have at the center of our universe uh, null hypothesis significance testing and the normal curve. Oh, the normal curve, sort of at the center of, of all things that we do. And, of course, the normal curve is very important. If it weren't important, the Germans wouldn't have put it on their money. Uh, <laughs> so it must be really important. Um, but what it means is that in our statistics curriculum, we keep having to sort of back out of this corner that we get ourselves into. As we get to more complex models or our data don't meet some of the assumptions, what we have to do is go, well, in this case, we do this. We use a method that doesn't assume normality. Or here, we think about the models differently, and it makes you wonder, why weren't you doing that from the start? If these methods and ways of thinking are good for way back, for the more advanced stuff, why wouldn't they be useful for the simple stuff uh, as well? And then, of course, I would say the number one reason is that the teaching is just notoriously 
notoriously bad. All right, so just coming in here, I'm talking to Dan, the videographer. Yeah, I had a, you know, I hated statistics. Rah, 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 rah. Um, usually it comes down to someone uh, having been a horrible instructor. It's sort of like the organic chemistry of graduate school, <laughs> right? For, uh, it's like, oh, ugh, you've got a battle scar for having survived it. Um, I love this particular uh, quote. I had a dream one time that I was teaching a statistics class. When I woke up, I was. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was one of my mentors. Uh, <laughs> and it just, it really sort of captures sort of that, that level of, of enthusiasm and excitement that we bring to each particular class. Um, so I will say that I, there were rough patches that I had when I have taught at various points in time. Uh, I remember the first time that I had to teach a graduate lecture, it was prior to being a faculty member, I was a graduate student, and uh, although my wife wouldn't want me to show this picture, that was me uh, as a graduate student. And what happened was I came into the office, uh, I came into the office fairly early as I did as graduate student, as all of graduate students should come into the office very, very early, and, um, and there, was, uh, there was a note there from Professor Sachs, and what it said was, Dr. Sachs is ill today, can you cover his class? And it said he is introducing factorial designs in ANOVA, right? So this was all written uh, by our administrative assistant. And so, you know, what are you supposed to say as a graduate student? The answer is, of course, I will cover this class, I will go do it. Now, I had an empty file cabinet, no materials, nothing I can go draw from. I'm just, I'm just a grad student uh, who, has sit, who has sat through a class and now I have to go teach it. So this class was going to be in less than an hour. I went and I just made some notes really, really quickly. And I, I went to the class at the appointed time. And just as I walked into the class, I was saved because Dr. Sachs came into the classroom. It's like, hallelujah, he's feeling well. So I, I go to hand Dr. Sachs the chalk. And he goes, no, no, too sick, too sick. <laughs> and he went and sat down. <laughs> So I had to deliver this lecture in front of Dr. Sachs and, and all of these people. And so the lecture went a little something like this. Um, I was talking about factorial designs, obviously, and I had, I had a simple little design where we had uh, gender male, female as one of the factors and treatment group as one of the factors. And what I said, since we had already covered, or they would have already covered what's called one-way analysis of variance, I said, well, let's just imagine these four groups as if they were their own entities, these four groups, and we can talk about the differences among those four groups and get what we know to be the sum of squares between, for those of you who have been through this, and so that's all the variability, all the differences among the averages in those particular groups. And I said, well, well, where are those differences coming from? And you know, so I'm trying to be inductive, getting the class involved, asking questions, all that. I said, well, some of the reason these people are different has to do with, with gender differences. And so we could compute the sum of squares for sex, which is differences between males and females. And then we could also talk about differences between the two treatment groups. And you know what the problem is, though, is that when we take all of the variability due to sex differences and all the variability due to group differences, it still doesn't add up to all the between group differences. And the class is like, yeah, why is that? That should be, you know, and I'm just, I'm feeling that I've got them to the edge of this cliff. I'm right there. Everybody is with me. Now, how are we going to solve this problem? What are we going to do? And the class is looking at me like, yeah, what are we going to do? And I said, we need to have group sex interaction. Uh -huh. And there's, it just came out. It just came out. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, I could not get them back after that. So, yeah. Um, when I made it to Maryland a number of years later, uh, there, <laughs> There were, I, got some, I got some of my teaching evaluations, like the, the first semester that I was teaching here, I got a couple of teaching evaluations, and I thought this was encouraging. <laughs> um, and then I, I got this one, which I thought was really sweet. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that nice? Um, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So, you know, a question for people in my area is what can we do to not, to not suck, to not bring these kinds of uh, opinions to people? And I, I think the answer exists on two, on two fronts, right? In terms of the content, are there things we can be doing in terms of content or, uh, or substance? And are there things that we can be doing in terms of delivery or style? And I think there are things we can be doing on both fronts. Uh, I think just overall, and I've alluded to this, uh, we really need a new operating system for how we do stuff. This, this null hypothesis significance testing that we, have, that we have hitched our wagon to, you know, 80 years ago, 90 years ago, uh, just is, is basically the equivalent of DOS, <laughs> right? And we're trying to accomplish things within this particular framework when we can, do, um, we can do so much more. So I'd really like to see that abandoned in favor of what I prefer to think of as a, a model-based reasoning framework or model-based inference kind of framework. And I have some stuff going on with a colleague of mine at Arizona State where we're really trying to we're really trying to devise what would be a somewhat universal strategy for approaching the different kinds of data analytic tasks that we might have where there are hypotheses to be tested and sort of early drafts of what we're doing have laid out a framework that looks sort of like this. Starts off with um, an articulation of our theory, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about these in turn. Uh, constructing our model, using our model, evaluating the model, uh, possibly comparing models and revising them, and then ultimately elaborating on those models in specific ways. And let me just show you this in the context of an example, but uh, by way of comparison, if we had the question, do freshmen, females, and males differ in terms of their statistics anxiety, it would go sort of like this. We would set up uh, a null hypothesis that their means are equivalent, typically, an alternative hypothesis that they are not equivalent, setting up a two-tailed framework that I don't know if males might have higher anxiety or females might have higher anxiety, um, gather some data from males and females, so there's some sample data, compute my appropriate test statistic, such as an observed T value, which makes certain assumptions. I didn't ask for it to make assumptions, but it has assumptions underlying it, like normality, uh, and that the variances across populations are homogeneous. Again, these, these don't have anything to do with my hypothesis at all. They're just sort of coming along for the ride. And in the end, I get a P value out that leads me to some particular inference in this case, if I'm doing tests at a common 0.05 level, it would mean I would retain the null hypothesis that there is no mean difference. Now, what that means and what that doesn't mean, um, we do not infer that the populations of freshmen, females, and males have the same average level of quantitative anxiety. Rather, we retain the baseline hypothesis for lack of compelling evidence to convince us otherwise. This is all part of the language that we use in this other framework. It's more likely, in fact, that at least some average difference does exist, um, but that we had insufficient statistical power, power to be able to overturn that baseline hypothesis in favor of one direction or another. And all of that is okay within that framework, but it doesn't, it doesn't always fit the way that we think about things. Uh, in this particular framework, if we start off with theory articulation, we ask, well, what is it we're interested in? I'm interested in what's typical in each population. What do I mean by what's typical? Uh, maybe I mean the means, right, the averages. But I don't have to. I might mean the medians, or I might mean the 45th percentile. I could mean whatever is important to me. I might also be interested in the extent to which individuals deviate from what's typical. That could be the variance, or it could be other measures of variability that might be of interest to me. And I advance a series of competing models. These are very simplistic ones, but I might have competing models that say that males and females have um, equal means or, uh, and equal variances in terms of this outcome, or equal means and, and unequal variances. And to elaborate on unequal, I might specify one direction versus the other if I want. Perhaps females are more homogeneous or males are homo more homogeneous. I don't know. I might have, sorry, I might have competing models that say they're unequal means and equal variances, unequal means, equal, unequal variances, a lot of different possibilities, and certainly able to be much more elaborate than this. I can have models that say females should be about five points higher than males on average. So I, this, this framework should not restrict what it is we're really interested in. Um, and for this example, Perhaps I have no specific prior beliefs or information, and if I did, I would want this framework to be able to accommodate that in some defensible way. And I move on to model construction and use. I am interested in getting scores on a scale to operationalize statistics anxiety. Um, that is part of it. I don't look inside people's heads to get their statistics anxiety. I need something that is a proxy for that, and that is really part of my model. 
right? As you make the leap from the construct you're interested in to the variable you hold in your hand, that is part of the model as a whole. And then our beliefs might be that the population distribution of statistics anxiety scores is fairly symmetric and maybe well approximated by a normal distribution, but it doesn't have to be. If I think they're fairly skewed, I can say I think they're fairly skewed. If I think they're shaped in some sort of interesting odd distribution, then it is my job to articulate that a priori. And the idea is that we're elevating these, these sort of backroom assumptions that go on in traditional methods to make it the uh, researcher's responsibility to articulate them, to defend them up front, make them part of the method, part of the model. And they are part of the model. And I don't think that they are a perfect part of the model because I don't really believe things are perfectly normal. I don't don't really believe the scores I have are exactly statistics anxiety. These are just parts of a model trying to explain things uh, that are going on. And then the models that I had articulated uh, previously would look sort of visually, maybe like this, equal means, equal variances, and so forth uh, for the others as well, just sort of representing them graphically. So now I go out and I gather my data, and the data for the males and females light might look like this, and I'm curious what happens under the different models. And so I impose model one that has equal means and equal variances. Now just looking at that, it sure doesn't feel like the scores are normal. Remember, those are samples, not populations. My theories are about population. But still, it might feel like my model is not perfect. Um, but I knew that all along, right? I knew my model wasn't perfect. The question is, how well does this model perform as compared to what I've articulated as model two or model three? And each time these are changing in terms of mean and or variability. These are my four models. And again, very simplistic examples of models. If I wanted to have competing models that have different dif distributions, absolutely fine as part of this particular framework. Um, now I need to make comparisons among those models and there are different ways to do that. Uh, something called information criteria is one way of doing it, uh, not the only way of doing it. But if I did use some information criteria, for those of you who know what those are, it would lead me to make a particular inference. In this particular case, it would lead me to make an inference about what among these is the best approximating model. In this case, it's a model in which freshman females are, uh, have higher statistics anxiety than males uh, and are more heterogeneous in that. So I have articulated models, made comparisons among those models, made a selection among those models, uh, and in this case, that is what I reached. And I don't, mean to, I don't mean to imply that this is a better framework because I got an answer I can talk about more easily, better framework because it, it forced me ar to articulate at every stage what it is I wanted to do. And after that, thinking about to what extent you can elaborate on your model. Are there... Um, are these gender differences in statistics anxiety, are they important? Are they actionable? To what extent do these go beyond my little study? And we can also think about things in terms of general, uh, generalizability. Do, would we expect them to hold in other populations, like high school students or graduate students? Would we expect them to hold in subpopulations, like liberal arts majors or physical science majors? Uh, would we expect our conclusions to hold if we measured statistics anxiety in other ways? So in this last phase, we're really questioning how far we can go with the inferences at this particular level and where they, where they could lead us after that. And again, we do stuff like this, or at least pieces of this, in our more advanced courses. We just don't do that in our intro courses. We have to retrain people when we get to the more advanced stuff. It's like, yeah, we, we don't really do that other stuff. And the question is, well, why? Why don't you... Why don't you do that? Maybe because you shouldn't have been doing it all along. Right? And this particular framework is something that, uh, that I've been working on over the last couple of years to, to varying degrees. So these are some ideas about how we could improve content. Um, these actually extend to a variety of other uh, more complex designs dealing with non-normality, measurement error, latent variables. Those are variables that we can't see but hypothesize the existence of. Uh, or dealing with small samples, multi-level data, which occur in education all the time, uh, dealing with missing data, mixtures, ordinal outcomes, even incorporating prior beliefs. So this particular framework, even though I showed it in the context of as really pretty much as simple an example as I can, once we can express these models for our data in a mathematical way, then we have a lot of flexibility. And I like a framework that has flexibility. Now, in terms of delivery on the other side, what are some things we can do uh, to improve the delivery of things? And I, I'm sure that you all knew this, but the World Statistics Organization has proclaimed 2013 International Year of Statistics, right? 
the World Statistics Organization proclaimed this, the International uh, Year of Statistics. And when I, when I heard that, I sort of got the same feeling I get when, uh, when Oprah Magazine announces the woman of the year. Um, but I digress. <laughs> uh, anyway, so... <laughs> Um, so the idea here, the, the theme of this International Year of Statistics, and I'm sure your families have made travel plans accordingly with the festivities. Uh, the idea is that being able to be competent researchers, of course, depends on, uh, at least in, in the you know, sciences, for example, depends on good statistical skills, but also just being consumers in our world depends on having good quantitative skills. And, and this, uh, this organization is really trying to raise awareness of that particular issue. And there are people who have held that view for a long time. Uh, I like this, statistical thinking one day becomes necessary, a qualification for efficient citizenship has the ability to read and write, H.G. Wells, right? Or, uh, or Florence Nightingale, statistics is the most important science in the whole world. For it depends the on the practical. For it depends on it depends the practical application of every other science and of every other art to understand God's thoughts. We must study statistics, for these are the measure of His purpose. Um, go Florence. I like. She got pretty strong there at the end, which which I <laughs> which I which I liked. Um, and I and I share these sentiments exactly. And I was looking through the Chronicle of Education just last week. And they had a headline that many students don't practice vital quantitative skills in class, a survey finds. And as it says there, the ability to digest quantitative information is crucial to everyday life, whether the purpose is trivial, like following baseball, uh, or profound, like participating in democracy. Um, and so we really need good ambassadors to try to break down some of these walls that, that statistics has, right? It's just not... Uh, it's not, it has a perception problem. It needs a better agent uh, in a way. So um, help me out with this one. Uh, knock, knock. Yeah. Super cool statistician. Super cool exactly, right? <laughs> we, there's just no super cool statistician. That's a problem. Uh, you are in very good company. We, we don't have right, an Indiana Jones of statistics who's out there solving ancient statistical mysteries, which exist, of course. Uh, we don't have Robert Langdon who's trying to find statistical meaning in art. Uh, we don't have, like, Bill Nye the statistics guy. Uh, that doesn't exist. We don't even have a Sheldon Cooper uh, from Big Bang Theory. And honestly, how hard would it have been to put a sigma right there? How hard, right? That's just, it's that easy. They could have done that. Um, they didn't do that. So we don't have these kinds of superheroes, people who raise awareness of statistics. What we have, and uh, I consider these people every bit the heroes, um, are people like this, the people who teach uh, statistics every single day. Uh, these are the folks that have the power to confirm your worst fears because you come into those classes with them, right? or to turn them around, to try to make you see why this is a reasonable subject matter, what it can help you to do. Um, and if you, think that, if you think that that particular person doesn't matter, it was a professor who is the reason I am here today. Um, when I was a graduate student, I mentioned that I was in a different graduate program, educational media, and I had, as I said, put my statistics class last, and I went to take it, all of my other coursework, except the other coursework I was taking in that particular uh, term, um, I, I, I had gotten it out of the way. And I went to the statistics class, and, you know, sort of like with arms folded, like everybody else who, who was in there. And the funny thing was is that I have a math degree. I have a chemistry degree, right? I, I have a background that is very quantitative, and yet I had, by the culture, become trained to hate this topic, even though I hadn't got there yet. And I went to my first lecture with Professor Alan Clockers at the University of Washington, and he came in with with no notes, just a, there was a piece of chalk up in front of the room. And he sort of talked to us for a while and asked some questions. And, you know, I, I was kind of following along a little bit. And the class went on, the class went on. And at the end of the class, I was kind of looking at the board. And there were formulas on the board. And there were numbers on the board. And I had just got sucked in. It was so good, you know? And I, he, he had done it so cleverly without even making us aware that he was doing it. And I just remember sitting there saying, that's it. That's, that's 
what I want to do. And I went and I dropped, that day, I dropped all of my other classes that were on my program, and I went to Professor Clocker's office and I said, I want to do what you do. And we, he had never met me before, and he, he very politely said, maybe you should have lecture number two before you make <laughs> sweeping, <laughs> sweeping career decisions. Um, <laughs> but in fact, I, I knew that if someone could take a subject matter that people there hate and turn everybody around to like it, that, that's an amazing thing to be able to do, and it's something that I wanted to grow to do as well. And so, what are some of the things that these kind of superheroes do? What are some of the things that we work on uh, as we go? Well, here's a list of some things. And, and what I will tell you right off the bat is that I don't claim to know what good teaching is. And that's not a facetious statement or a modest statement. I honestly don't know. I know some things that make students want to relate to me more, being willing to engage more. I don't know that that's good teaching or not. Um, but it does seem to help. And these are some of the things that, I, um, that I've noted here. Um, demonstrating empathy, understanding, and support. It's not something you typically associate with a statistics class, but when people are scared out of their minds in that introductory class, if you do not do that, if you don't acknowledge that this is hard for some people, and it might be hard for you, and let's see what we can do to try and make it more accessible for you, you it, it makes a world of difference if you can empathize with those people, right? And I... Uh, there's an old saying, and you've heard it before, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It is absolutely true. Um, and I remember coming home to my wife a number of times when I was teaching introductory statistics, and it might be, might be week four of the semester, and I would come home and I would say, today they're mine. And that meant that for the first three weeks, I had been relationship building, getting them to believe that I wasn't somebody to beat but somebody that was there to help them to achieve something. And that in intro stat usually occurs about week four. Um, we should uh, make sure that we keep our door open, right? And that's a very easy thing to say, but the problem is statistics is for many people an unapproachable subject. And if we ourselves are unapproachable, then people are not going to go the extra mile. Uh, and so we really have to be uh, we have to be as accessible as possible. Um, never stop learning about your subject matter and your students. Uh, so about your subject matter, the, more, the better you understand it, right? The, the more explanations you're able to give, the more you understand your students, the better you're able to tailor those explanations to where they're coming in on the material. Um, I really like this. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Uh, so work hard to understand it, whether, whether the it is, yeah, I see that too. Um, the, whether the it is your subject matter or the it is your students. Um, targeting the material to your students' level. And we have this view that everybody who comes into our course, they should be just like us, right? And the faculty are not just like other people. We're the, we're the weird ones, right? The weird ones who said, this is what we want to do for a living. And so we are this person in class, and we think that all of the students are that person in class, and they're... <laughs> They're not, right? They're, they're not like that. And we really need to understand where they're coming in. Now, I don't want to confuse that with dumbing down material or lowering our expectations. It's just understanding what it's going to take to get them up to what we want them to achieve. Um, selecting relevant and current examples when possible. Statistics has a history of being things like uh, you have five red balls and, and eight blue balls in an urn, and you reach in and draw, or, or dice, or coin flips, and all that. And those are relevant for some foundational topics, but really you got it, especially in the social sciences and education, you got to get it to things that people might care about, or real problems so they can understand the context. And if, like, this is a headline from recently, uh, taken from some news, pesticides and food linked to ADD. That's an incredible conversation piece right there. How do you link pesticides uh, to ADD. What, does it mean that they just co-occurred? Was an experiment done? I'm going to randomly give these people pesticides and these people not. Follow these children, right? I mean, how, how do you do this kind of thing? It's, it's a very important issue when it comes to untangling issues of causality and experimental design and gives you kind of a cool hook to get in there and sneak some statistics in there along the way. Um, Wi-Fi enabled laptops may nuke sperm. Again, I don't know how they did that. I don't know how they got that past human subjects, frankly. <laughs> Um, you know, 
Uh, and, and, you know, sort of a favorite, SpongeBob may cause learning problems, um, <laughs> opens up the real headlines, opens up uh, a lot of really good discussions, especially when you start throwing around words like cause. What does that mean? Can, can we ever infer that? Um, and then some other points that you have to underscore organization in all of your materials and lessons. This is a very complex topic for people, and if you're disorganized, that just contributes to the, to the chaos that goes on. Very important to be incredibly, um, incredibly meticulous in those kinds of things. Certainly committing to always improving your instruction. And I, you know, sometimes when I have a bad lesson, I can feel it, and I go back to my office and kind of flop into my chair and go, oh, okay, what went wrong? What didn't they understand? Or if I'm grading their homeworks or their exams, you have to be willing to treat that as a reflection on you, right? Not that, oh, I got a bunch of bad students this semester. Well, maybe you're just not that good this semester. Maybe you're doing something differently. You have to be willing to look at yourself and hold yourself accountable for these kinds of things. And then just keeping it fun, right? Trying to, this, I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but I think, People have certain expectation that these classes are to some degree uh, infotainment, right? That, that we're trying to convey information while at the same time engaging them. And so draw from things. And if you're not a fun person, find some things that are fun, right? There are all kinds of things out there on the web. I like this, right? If you want to look at how Earth just continues to dominate in the Miss Universe pageant, still going strong, uh, you know, that's... That's a graphic representation of data. People like that sort of thing. Uh, accuracy of representations, right? That is the world's most accurate pie chart. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as we mentioned, uh, discussing other distributions besides normal, including perhaps the paranormal <laughs> distribution. It's, it's very, very spooky, of course. Um, as I said in the end, I don't really know what makes good teaching. Uh, but these are some of the things that help, and it's a lot maybe to digest. So if you just sort of keep your mind on where it all started, uh, <laughs> that's sort of the underlying theme, right, when we go into the classroom that we do that. Uh, there's some people here today that I would just like to acknowledge. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Halima, who was coordinated everything, Halima Sharif, Dean Wiseman for supporting this particular event. Uh, my family is here, my father who taught me algebra uh, because I couldn't understand my teachers. Um, we, had a, we had a blackboard in our family room and there was dad, you know, doing algebra with me and I actually remember the day and the problem when I understood algebra and that was my, my father's doing. Um, my family, you're wonderful, my wife, my kids, uh, and some other family who's less amazing, frankly, but they're, uh, but they're here. And uh, so, and then a lot of colleagues that I have sprinkled in there among family, and I consider my colleagues and influential teachers um, all part of my larger family as well. Um, and then, honestly, uh, one of the greatest gifts of all uh, are, are these particular people right here, the students that I've had the honor of working with over the last, uh, you know, like 23 years, however many years I've been doing it. Um, students earn their ears when they, uh, when they do a research paper, either a conference presentation or a publication, and this is not all of them, but this is a, a number of them. Some of you in this room see yourselves up there, and, and I will say in all complete candor that this is really the best award ever is to be able to have those kinds of people every single day. Uh, so in the end, just thank you. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I, I believe we're supposed to open it up for questions, or you can go eat the... I think we're down to a couple of juice boxes and graham crackers out there. So if you would like that, I'm also happy to just wait down here if anybody wants to chat. But again, thank you all very much for coming.